I wanted to start this morning by putting a thought into our minds about this notion of expectations. Uh, I think we live with a lot of expectations, expectations of ourselves, expectations that we have of our family and our friends, of, of expectations that we have of one another. We, I think we live with a high level of expectation about uh, how things ought to be. I think we even live with high expectations uh, with God, and how, how we think God ought to be using His great power in our lives to, to do uh, things that we expect Him to do for one reason or another. And I, I want to plant that thought, and then I want to plant this thought. What happens in our lives when God doesn't meet those expectations? Because that's probably happened to everybody here. What, what, what happens in your heart? Think about that for a minute. What, what goes on in your heart when, when things you were anticipating go wrong and you know God could have stopped that and he didn't or you know that God could have done that differently and he didn't and um, here, here's the question is is the state of our hearts a state of faith in those moments when we talk about the notion of faith I want to talk about it in the context of God not meeting expectations my expectations, what does faith look like in that moment? Or is there faith in that moment? That's where I want to go today. Uh, I think as we look at the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, that it will address this issue of uh, Jesus breaking expectations. And the question is, will they still believe when... He doesn't show up and he doesn't live out the last week of his life the way that we thought he was going to. Uh, that's where faith is revealed to be genuine. That's where faith is forged. And so we're going to talk about it. As we get into this next passage in John, we're just going chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph through the book of John. And uh, as we get into this next section, I, I want to set the context a little bit. Uh, context, when it comes to the meaning of a text, a, a biblical text, context is king. You've got to know your context so that you can understand what's happening here. So let me set the context a little bit, and uh, I want to do it by uh, introducing you to a few crowds. We're going to talk about four different crowds today. And it gets a little bit confusing, so I want to kind of draw your attention to them. The first crowd I want you to be aware of is the crowd that was with Mary and Martha and Lazarus when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. We're going to call that crowd number one or the resurrection crowd. That should be pretty easy to remember who they are. Resurrection crowd. The second crowd we need to be aware of as we come into this particular passage is this a uh, massive multitude of people who have been flocking into Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover. This is the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, he's coming to the Passover. Uh, not only Jesus to, is coming to the Passover, but uh, there are people from all around Israel coming into Jerusalem in particular. This is one of three uh, pilgrim feasts for the Israelites and so people come from all over the land. They come into Jerusalem. Typically, uh, scholars think that Jerusalem had a population of somewhere between 40,000 people and 100,000 people normally. I know that's a big gap, but we're working from ancient documents. We, we don't know for sure. 40 to 100,000. During Passover, you're looking at numbers influxing to about 250,000 to a million people. So, again, that's... That's a big uh, variance, like, wh well, which one is it? Quarter million or a full million? Well, we don't really know, but let's at least say that the population of Jerusalem increases by multiple hundreds of thousands during the time of Passover. So we've got this giant crowd in Jerusalem. Let's call that the Passover multitude. You with me so far? We've got the uh, crowd number one, who, is, who are the resurrection witnesses, and we've got crowd number two, the Passover multitude. 
And then we'll see that the Passover multitude has some subcategories, and I'll point those out as we go along today. Um, as you've got this giant crowd in Jerusalem the week before uh, Passover begins, which will be on Thursday night, uh, in Bethany, about two miles away, we have another little scene. And we looked at this last week. It's a, it, it's a dinner held in, the, in, in honor of Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. It's a dinner. It's, it's thrown by, uh, looks like, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, the family of the man who was raised. They throw a dinner in honor of Jesus. And w- from what we looked at last week, it seems like a pretty intimate little scene. You've got, you've got uh, the, some foot anointing going on. It seems like a pretty personal and intimate scene. And it turns out that by the end of the night... Uh, it, it's a pretty large-scale event. Look with me at chapter 12, verse 9. And when the large crowd of the Jews, okay, Passover multitude, learned that Jesus was there, they came. Came where? To Bethany. Okay, so they're having this dinner. Passover multitude hears about the dinner. They go to Bethany, not only on account of him, Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. We can't have this going on. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Okay, so this, this... Passover multitude, they, they, they know that something has happened with Lazarus. They've heard the news about what Jesus did with Lazarus. Turns out, verse 17 tells us that that, that, that uh, resurrection crowd, they've been like telling everybody about what's going on. They're spreading news all over Jerusalem about what's going on. So the Passover multitude, they hear that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and they find out that Jesus is in Bethany, and so a whole bunch of them, they go out. We're going to call this the dinner crowd. They go out on a Saturday night to the dinner, interrupting this foot, this foot anointing that we looked at last week. They head out there, um, and they want to see Jesus, and they want to see Lazarus, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd be there. I'd, I'd go to this, right? I was like, he's only two miles away? Yeah, I don't mind walking. Uh, we're, you know, we're heading out there. We're going to go see him. And the response of the chief priest, now the chief priests are the, you remember, they're, they're the majority of the people that make up what's known as the Sanhedrin the Jewish council, the major Jewish council in Israel, the chief priests, they, they look at all these people going and they say, you know what, we're going to have to kill Lazarus. <laughs> Why? Because, verse 11, on account of him, many of the Jews were, check it out, going away and believing in Jesus. So the chief priests, the, the Jewish High council. They recognize that Jews are responding to the fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the day from the dead, and they are going away and they are converting to Jesus. They're leaving. They're leaving the perspective of the leadership with regards to Jesus, and they're believing in Jesus. The leadership has said he's not the Messiah, and they're saying they are going away from that perspective, and they are believing in him. He is the Messiah. And so the priests have to kill Lazarus for the same reason that they decided to kill Jesus in chapter 11. If people believe in Jesus, there will be this messianic fervor. There will be an uprising. There will be a revolt. And if there's a revolt of people believing that Jesus is the Messiah, pushing against Rome, what's Rome going to do? They're going to destroy the nation. So we got to kill Jesus. We got to kill Lazarus. Because we can't have belief going on, because we can't have a revolt going on, because we can't be destroyed. Okay, that's the mentality. Jesus cannot be popularly regarded as the Messiah. 
and people are going away and believing in him. And it's that note that's ringing in our ears that forms our perspective as we come to the triumphal entry. It's a belief scene. It's a, it's a scene that is framed by people are leaving the perspective of the leadership and they are believing in Jesus. This is a belief scene. There is never a point in the ministry of Jesus where he is more popular, more believed in than the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, a March, uh, let's see, 29th, 33 AD in all likelihood. We can, we, can, we, can, we can pinpoint the day. We think we can pinpoint the day if, you, if you're tracking with some of the historical information. March 29th, 33 AD, the day in which there was never a more widespread expression of belief in Jesus Christ while he walked the earth. And though it's really a beautiful moment of recognition of Jesus, and rightly so, it's also tinged with the irony that in just a few days, the crowds are going to sing a very different tune because this is not the Messiah that they expected. It's a faith scene, but it's faith in a particular expectation of the Messiah. So let's take a look at the belief scene here, verses 12 to uh, 17, or let's see, 12 to 19, and we're going to make some observations. Read it with me one more time. Uh, Verse 12, the next day... The large crowd that had come to the feast, okay, Passover multitude, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel! And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Okay? There's all these people, there's the palm branches, they're, Hosanna, Hosanna! And, there's, and then the, the resurrection witnesses, they're like running around like little ants everywhere telling, this is the guy that rose Lazarus from the dead. So they're continuing to bear witness. Now the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that we're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Okay, so verse 12 says that the next day, the day after the dinner, which was Saturday, so Sunday, Palm Sunday, the next day, the Passover multitude in Jerusalem, they hear that Jesus is coming from Bethany, where he had dinner last night. He's coming into Jerusalem, and in a great display of faith, this huge crowd goes out to meet Jesus. That's our fourth crowd. We're going to call it the Palm Sunday crowd. Okay, So crowd one is the resurrection witnesses. Crowd two is the Passover multitude Crowd three is the who? The Saturday dinner crowd. And crowd four now is the Palm Sunday crowd. And they have heard that Jesus uh, is coming from Bethany into Jerusalem. And they go out to meet him. They're they're in total praise. Uh, Now, the reason that they are going out there is because they've heard about what Jesus did. Look at verse 18. The reason why the crowd, the Palm Sunday crowd, went out to meet him on Palm Sunday was that they heard he had done this sign. And so here they go. They're going out there to meet him in praise. And here's what they say, verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Four things I want to point out here. Number one is this, th- these palm branches. What's going on with the palm branches? Uh, the palm branch was a symbol of Jewish national pride. Uh, Jews used palm branches to celebrate 
uh, successful victories over uh, foreign enemies who had invaded the land. So when the Maccabees drive out the Syrians in 141 BC, there's a great celebration with palm, with palm branches. Uh, Jewish insurrectionists in the first century uh, minted their coins with palm branches on them. Uh, the palm branch was a sign of nationalistic pride. And so they're taking these palm branches out, and they're not doing it to cool them down with a breeze, right? They're doing it because they're making a statement, this is our Messiah, this is our national deliverer, our military leader, our social and political reformer and liberator. This is faith in Jesus as the Messiah. The second thing to notice is that they joyfully meet Jesus crying out to him with a quote from Scripture, Psalm 118, Hosanna! I worked on this yesterday. I was like, how do you, how do you think they said it? Hosanna! Hosanna! No, it was like, like I'm imagining the men out there, and they're like, Hosanna! Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel! You know, it's just a, this is a wild celebration. This is the Messiah. Hosanna. Right? Going crazy. Hosanna. Literally translated, Lord, please save us. That's what it means. I know. I worked on this. I was like, I hope, I hope Andrew and Jennifer yesterday... They live right next door. I hope they're not like, oh my gosh, what is he doing? <laughs> oh, Lord, save us. It was a, uh, it, they used this phrase, Hosanna. It's, it's a request. Please save us. Save, save us. They used it as, um, like the way we use hallelujah. It's just a, it's just a dec general declaration of praise or praise the Lord. Um, but it was a, a declaration of praise that was a request. So they got these palm branches in, in a nationalistic fervor. This is our Messiah. And they're crying out in praise to him and saying, save us. The third thing to notice here, also from Psalm 118, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're quoting this scripture. Uh, they're using this as a reference to Jesus as the Messiah. Jewish uh, commentators came to understand this passage in Psalm 118 uh, as uh, a reference to the Messiah. And the crowd is excited to attribute that title to Jesus. He is the Messiah. We are crying out in praise to him for salvation, and he's being honored as the national deliverer. And then fourth of all, they just come straight out and, and say it, the king of Israel. The king, this is our king. This is our king. The whole Palm Sunday crowd is making a bold statement of faith in Jesus as the Messiah. But it seems as though they probably have some uh, misunderstandings, some expectations that Jesus simply is not going to fulfill in the way that they thought he was going to. And with the way that it's unfolding, it appears that the Sanhedrin was perhaps correct in their fear that this, this belief in Jesus is going to stir up an uprising. And if Jesus had come in on a war horse, that is certainly what would have happened, isn't it? But that's not the posture that he takes when he comes into town. Verse 14. And Jesus, in light of all this, found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now John frames it almost as though it's a response to the Passover crowd. That's, that's how he sets it up. Uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus got on a donkey. Uh, 
So he sees the enthusiasm. He's expecting, uh, or they're expecting him to be the leader of some sort of revolt and uprising. And then Jesus hops on a baby donkey, and it does two things. One, it affirms that he is, in fact, the king. He's, he, he intentionally hops on the donkey to affirm, I am the king. Uh, it was a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. John quotes Zechariah chapter 9 in verse 15 here in John 12. Your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah that the king of Israel will come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It's reminiscent of the enthronement of Solomon. Uh, king David's son, when he goes to his coronation, he rides on a mule. Jesus is making the claim that he is, in fact, the king of Israel. But he's doing it in such a way that it's very apparent that he is a humble king. Uh, The donkey was a symbol of humility and gentleness and peace. So, yes, Jesus is claiming to be king, but he does it in a way that avoids feeding the frenzy. He does it in a way that... uh, Avoid stirring an insurrection. And the disciples were confused by it. They didn't understand this. Look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. What are you doing? But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The disciples, they didn't understand the significance of everything that's taking place in this scene. It doesn't make sense until after the death of Jesus and then his resurrection from the dead. Then they look back on the event, and in hindsight, ah, (laughs) the donkey. Hmm. At the time, it probably seemed painfully subdued and restrained and even frustrating. Uh, It's hard to do this because we know where this is going, right? We know that when Jesus comes in all humble, that he's going to the cross. We know that. So, So it's hard to do this. But imagine that you didn't know what was coming. And imagine that you believed that this was in fact the king of Israel. What if you didn't know about the cross or the resurrection and you believe that the long-awaited king is finally here? I mean, why not work this crowd into a frenzy? They're finally believing in you, Lord. I mean, they're worshiping you, Lord. Let's make war, Messiah. Let's do it. I mean, look at these crowds. Look at all this faith. You got these people who saw you raising Lazarus from the dead, and they're running around like, like, like little chipmunks, just telling everybody about, about your, your resurrection power. And then, and then this, remember all those people that came to dinner last night? And look, look at all these people. Look at all this faith. What's up with the donkey? Why are you riding a donkey? Where's the horse? And they didn't understand until he was glorified. Oh, <laughs> that's what was going on. We, we were thinking of him as a nationalistic savior, and we believed in him with that dream in mind. And he didn't feed that dream. He rode in as a humble king, as a gentle Messiah, because, ah, we didn't even see this coming. His war would be won through his humble, sacrificial, peacemaking, death and resurrection. Our king, he is a king. He won the victory through the unexpected path of suffering and death. That's what the donkey was all about. I didn't even see that before. You see, it clicked once they understood what the humility was, what, was, was, was all about. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't clear until he died and that he meant to die. 
And it wasn't just riding into town that confused them. I mean, the whole week had a very donkey-like feel to it, right? I mean, it's marked by this incredibly disturbing and humiliating death. He suffered unspeakable pain, and then he dies? That is not a good conclusion to a reign. Uh, what's he doing? Right? Why isn't he fighting? I thought this was the king. And then the resurrection gave clarity to the suffering. You, 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 you might want to write that phrase down. The resurrection gave clarity to the suffering. And you know what that means? It means that when it comes to suffering, both as we read John's gospel and as we experience it in our own lives, we have a perspective that the disciples didn't have, that the disciples couldn't have at this point in the story. Because we know, and they didn't, where the story's going. So when Christ chooses to do His work by using the path of pain, we're not taken off guard by it like they were. When when we read that Jesus is betrayed and arrested and rejected and mistreated and tortured and slandered and He suffers and then He dies, we're not surprised by that, nor should we be surprised when we face trials of many kinds. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Because we know that the story of Jesus and His people is a story that is flavored by His cross. We know that. We know that. The Christian life has a donkiness to it. It really does. But it doesn't throw us for a loop because we already know where the story is going. We know about the cross and we know about the resurrection. And therefore, we know that all the things that are tainted with lowliness and brokenness and death will be overthrown by the wonders of the resurrection of Jesus. We know this. And yet, I think that sometimes and perhaps even often, We forget where the story is going, and we forget that for the time being, in the kingdom of God, things are not as they seem on the surface, and we resist the donkeyness of the Christian life. We don't want it, and we don't like it. And so we actually then slip into a mentality that resembles something like these crowds and these disciples who didn't know what was coming. And then we live with a kind of faith that believes, yes, in the almighty power of Jesus. And mistakenly, we think that somehow that guarantees that He's going to use that power here and now for deliverance from our pain, from our enemies. Like the crowds, our faith in Jesus is very strong for the accomplishment of a dream for how we want this world to be and what we think He ought to do with that power. We believe in Him for the success of our good and just and healthy and righteous cause. And though we may not expect Him to be overthrowing the Romans, we're sure hoping that He'll make this body work right We're hoping that he'll make this relationship work out. We're hoping that he's going to work this situation out in my favor. We're hoping that he's going to ease these burdens. We're hoping he's going to help me replace my donkey of a car, buy a home, pay for schooling, help me get a job that I finally enjoy, bring me a spouse, and then in response to these very good, these very reasonable, and often even godly desires. Sometimes He actually does grant the prayer, and we give Him thanks, and we praise Him. But sometimes, not always, but even often, I might say, in response to these desires, He brings you an ass of a situation. I mean it in the donkey sense, mostly. (laughs) And we're thinking, this is not... What I was hoping for. 
and I don't understand. What is up with this donkey that you come riding in on? I don't like this. And it's at that moment that we often forget, hey, where is this story going? We already know. We already know. We forget, though, that the kingdom was established by means of blood, and we forget that it is not entered by a wide gate, nor is it traveled by an easy path. Jesus taught us again and again and again, this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard. My kingdom is not of this world. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. The cup that I drink, you will drink. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Our outer self is wasting away. You know, we know these things, but we forget these things. We forget that our king rode into glory on a donkey. And then he went to a cross, and then he, then he called us to take up a cross and to follow him. We, we know we signed up for this. And we forget that this is so often where God does his greatest work. And this is where our faith is revealed to be genuine. And this is where our faith is forged. It's easy to believe in a Messiah that will today take away all your pain and allow you to actually see that everything is under control. That's the faith of the crowds. Will you believe in him now, even if his method of victory takes the path of humility and mystery and suffering? Will you hold fast to him, though he rides upon a donkey and asks you to embrace his inconspicuous and humbling road to glory? Will you follow him even then? Will you trust Jesus when you suffer? That's my question. Will we trust him even as we suffer? And our expectations have been broken. We have this treasure, the gospel of the glory of Christ. We are heirs of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. We have this treasure in jars of what? Clay. We are very, very fragile. But when we enter into glory, for ourselves, how many things will we look back on and say, <laughs> that's what that stupid donkey was for? I get it now. See, we know that's coming. I promise you that's coming. We know it. So will you hold on? When the, when the clay pot starts crumbling, will you hold on? Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. With perfect hindsight, someday we'll understand the beauty and the goodness of the things that are currently hurting so badly. And so believe, 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 not merely like the crowds who were willing to believe as long as Jesus upheld their expectations. They're not, this crowd is singing a different tune at the end of the week. Believe, not like the crowds, but believe as those who trust that all things, even our sorrows, every uh, 
humbling, every lowly providence that God brings into our lives is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look to the things that look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal let's pray